Hello. Today we are uh, here to discuss about a very interesting clinical problem which is emerging as one of the most important social and medical issues facing the medical community. I refer to the problem of sleep disordered breathing otherwise known to the medical community as obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Basically primary sleep disorders may be classified into two broad categories. One is dysomnias which produce insomnia or excessive daytime sleepiness. The other is parasomnias which does not cause insomnia or excessive sleepiness but which refers to events which intrude into or occur during sleep. Dysomnias which is what we are concerned about may be intrinsic or extrinsic or may also refer to disorders of the circadian rhythm. Intrinsic dysomnias refer to conditions like obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, central alveolar hyperventilation syndrome. Whereas extrinsic dysomnias refers to extrinsic factors like noise, altitude, drugs, allergies, poor sleep habits, stress, all of which may interfere with sleep. A good example of the third category which is disorders of circadian rhythm is the typical jet lag syndrome with which all of us are quite familiar. Parasomnias on the other hand do not intrude or interfere with sleep and do not cause excessive sleepiness and they may be arousal disorders like confusional disorders or sleepwalking, sleep terrors and so on. Sleep wake transition disorders like sleep talking, sleep starts, rhythmic movement disorders. Parasomnias related to REM sleep like nightmares and sleep paralysis and others such as bruxism and nocturnal aneurysis. When we see a patient with sleep disordered problems of breathing, it is very important for us to first of all categorize them into one of three categories. Is it primary snoring? Is it upper airway resistance syndrome? Or is it obstructive sleep apnea syndrome? The difference between the three are quite striking. In primary snoring, the patient has very heroic snoring for which he presents or he or she presents to the doctor. But on investigation, it is quite clear that the respiratory distress index about which we will talk later is quite normal. In other words, there is no apnea or hypopnea. Oxygen saturation is maintained during sleep well over 90 percent and there is no daytime sleepiness. In other words, there is snoring and snoring only. In upper airway resistance syndrome, there is no apnea or hypopnea which is significant. The ox oxygen saturation is also maintained but interestingly the patient may report daytime somnolence or sleepiness. Obstructive sleep apnea syndrome which is by far more common is characterized by definite events of apnea or hypopnea, oxygen saturation which may fall well below 90 percent and typically these patients have daytime sleepiness which brings them to the doctor. The simple system for grading of snoring exists and it is something which I like. A grade 1 is an occasional snorer especially when he is very tired after alcohol intake or especially when he is lying supine. This disappears when he turns his position. A grade 2 snorer has frequent but not always episodes of snoring but the snoring is present in all positions and continues throughout the sleep period and may also be heard outside the room. Grade 3 which is the worst is very typical heroic snoring which can be heard not just outside the room but sometimes throughout the entire 
house and it's always associated irrespective of the position of the patient. Sleep apnea syndrome, before we start talking about it, it's important for us to, to discuss the semantics because there are so many terminologies which are used with in this particular condition. First of all, what is apnea? It's important for us to define apnea. An apnea is a cessation of airflow at the nostril or mouth and it should at least last for 10 seconds to be considered as significant. For a sleep apnea syndrome, we have to have 30 or more such apneic episodes during a 7 hour sleep period. An apneic index or apnea index it refers to the number of apneas per hour of sleep equal to or usually greater than 5 in a patient with sleep apnea syndrome. Hypopnea is a reduction in tidal volume by at least 50 percent reduction in airflow at the nose or at the mouth lasting for a 10 second period in the presence of continued respiratory effort. Respiratory disturbance index or RDI or apnea hypopnea index or AHI are terms which are very useful and often used to quantify the problem and this refers to the total number of episodes of apnea and hypopnea per hour of sleep. In obstructive sleep apnea in syndrome, the respiratory disturbance index or RDI is typically greater than 10. What are the types of sleep apnea syndrome? Sleep apnea syndrome is divided into two polar types, the obstructive sleep apnea syndrome which is by far the most common, perhaps amounting to about 80 to 90 percent of patients we see, where there is a cessation of airflow in the presence of continued respiratory effort. In other words, there is an obstruction to the airflow but the respiratory effort still continues. In central sleep apnea, the respiratory effort ceases, there is no airflow at the nose or the mouth. In a mixed apnea, there is a combination of both. Initially, it may start off as a central apnea, then it becomes obstructive. Now, polysomnography will typically show the difference between obstructive apnea mixed apnea and central apnea and also in hypopnea where if you compare the airflow with the respiratory effort we can see that the airflow stops in the presence of respiratory effort in obstructive apnea and in hypopnea but in mixed apnea there is a combination of both and in central apnea there is neither a respiratory effort nor an airflow. Central sleep apnea is fortunately very uncommon and is more often seen in patients who have problems with of a neurological nature or usually of very severe pathophysiological problems. It is seen characteristically in high altitudes, congestive cardiac failure, frontal lobe damage and brain stem lesions and in mixed edema. Obstructive sleep apnea is much more common and it is a typical intrinsic dysomnia characterized by recurrent episodes of upper airway collapse and obstruction during sleep. These episodes of obstruction are associated with recurrent oxyhemoglobin desaturation and arousal from sleep. Both anatomic and neuromuscular factors play an important role. In obstructive sleep apnea, partial upper airway obstruction occurs this causes a turbulent airflow with vibration of the soft palate, uvula, fossil pillars, lateral pharyngeal walls and sometimes the tongue base which we recognize as snoring. So snoring in obstructive sleep apnea can often be taken as a warning sound or a warning signal. I often refer to it as the sound of an airway obstruction happening in a person who is crying for attention. Obstructive sleep apnea is often diagnosed by polysomnography and this demonstrates an upper airway obstruction during sleep. In obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, 
there is greater than 5 obstructive ventilatory events per hour plus clinical symptoms in the same patient. Historically, sleep apnea syndrome has been recognized for many, many years even though it was not called as such. The classical Pickwickian papers of Charles Dickens in 1836, the Pickwickian syndrome described by Dr. Burwell in 1956, Demond Eldridge in 1973 described sleep apnea syndrome and probably established one of the first sleep clinics. The American Sleep Association grades sleep apnea into mild, moderate and severe categories and it's a very simple classification to follow. In mild sleep apnea, there is a totally of 5 to 20 apneas per hour with the oxygen saturation SAO2 always above 85 percent. In moderate sleep apnea, there are about 21 to 40 apneas per hour and oxygen saturation ranges between 65 to 84 percent. In severe sleep apnea, there are more than 40 apneic episodes per hour and oxygen saturation may fall below 65 percent. The incidence of sleep apnea varies from place to place from the age group as well as the study population. In children, an average incidence quoted is about 1 to 3 percent. Sleep disordered breathing, which includes of course heroic snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome and sleep apnea ranges from about 25 percent to in men to about 9 to 10 percent in women if we take all age groups from 30 to 60. Mild obstructive sleep apnea alone is quoted as having an incidence of about 4 percent in males and 2 percent in females of all age groups. Moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea is reported in 2 percent of males of all age groups again. Of course, the age has a great deal of variation and as we go up the age ladder, we also see the incidence gradually increasing. In general, there is definitely a male predilection in this condition. As per the older guidelines, the apnea hypopnea index more than 10 is seen in about 2 to 4 percent of the population. In the newer guidelines, the apnea hypopnea index of over 5 who are also symptomatic, if they are taken, then the incidence sharply rises to anything from 10 to 25 percent of the general population. What is the pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea? There is an abnormal neuromuscular control of pharyngeal dilators. So, the genia glosses, genia hyoid, the palatoglossus, medial pterygoids, all of which are pharyngeal dilators, may have problems during sleep. This leads to a collapse and a narrowing of the airway, which may usually range anywhere from the nasal vestibule all the way to the glottis. This narrowing leads to an venturi effect with increased intraluminal negative pressure and consequent upper airway obstruction. So, this completes the cycle and leads to a vicious cycle going on and on. Fujita gave in my opinion a very useful classification which is to classify the level of obstruction and this becomes particularly important from the surgeon's perspective if he is trying to correct the problem surgically. Fujita's classification recognizes three types. Type 1 which is mainly palatal, it is retropalatal. Type 2 which may be retropalatal and retrolingual and type 3 which is exclusively retrolingual. One of the very useful investigations to delineate the type of obstruction as per the Fujita classification is the sleep MRI or the dynamic MRI which shows the exact level of the collapse and is very useful for the surgeon to put his fingers on the problem and say that the level of collapse is type 1 or type 2 or type 3. Now, this is a sleep MR which shows a classical type 1 obstruction. Note the soft palate and how the soft palate collapses back 
and causes airway obstruction. The retrolingual space is well maintained. This, this is a type 2 obstruction, a sleep MR, wherein the tongue and the soft palate both are collapsing. The retrolingual space gets obliterated. You can also notice that the soft palate is collapsing back. Such a patient obviously is not going to improve by only correction of palatal problems, but will also need some, the problem of the tongue collapse addressed. Obstructive sleep apnea syndrome causes several effects, but basically it leads to oxygen desaturation, causing increased sympathetic output with peripheral vasoconstriction. A high negative intrathoracic pressure occurs with arousal and termination of the obstructive episode. What are the causes of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome? Again, this varies from the age group, but in general, problems in the pharynx and larynx far outweigh the problems in the nose. In the nose, nasal polyps, gross septal deviations, allergic rhinitis, and in fact, even nasal packing in patients who are prone, who have had nasal surgery, can all precipitate obstructive sleep apnea. In the pharynx, nasopharyngeal tumors, enlarged adenoids in children, palatal and lingual tonsils which are very hypertrophic, retropharyngeal masses, an enlarged tongue base and significantly micro or retrognathia can all present with obstructive sleep apnea. Laryngeal tumors like edema and tumors of the larynx can also present with obstructive sleep apnea. Crowded oropharynx, as can be seen from this particular slide, is a very classical finding in many patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Note the very edematous and long uvula. In pediatric obstructive sleep apnea, the commonest etiology is tonsillar and tonsillar adenoid hypertrophy. Occasionally, neuromuscular hypotonia and craniofacial and neurological, neurological syn syndromes may also cause the problem. Rarely, syndromes like Appert syndrome, Cruzon's disease, Pierre Robin syndrome, Treacher Collins syndrome may all present with obstructive sleep apnea. Neuromuscular diseases seen in cerebral palsy, Duchenne type of muscular dystrophy, Arnold Chiari malformation may also present with obstructive sleep apnea. Nasal septal hematomas, which are post-traumatic, have been known to present with obstructive sleep apnea. And nasal polyposis in children with cystic fibrosis can also present with obstructive sleep apnea. What are the common clinical features? The most common and perhaps the most striking clinical feature is snoring. And snoring is a very important accompaniment in obstructive sleep apnea. Excessive daytime sleepiness is again a very common feature and many patients com complain about this. There have been e incidents where some of them have dozed off even during driving resulting in road traffic accidents and so on. Less common symptoms include early morning headache, waking up with a feeling of a hangover, personality changes, intellectual deterioration, depression, abnormal body movements during sleep, frequent waking up during sleep, nocturnal choking, and even importance. There are some other pathophysiological events which are commonly associated with obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, and it will be good for us to remember these when we are looking at a patient with obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. One of the most common accompaniments is gastroesophageal reflux or laryngopharyngeal reflux. Many of these patients have very edematous posterior larynx and may often complain of choking episodes during sleep, which is a reflection of the laryngopharyngeal reflux. Systemic hypertension, coronary artery disease, and depression may all happen during sleep. Pulmonary hypertension, right heart failure, cardiac arrhythmias, cord pulmonale have all been thought to be associated with obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. 
This is a, a video of a patient who has associated laryngopharyngeal reflux. Note the classical edema of the posterior larynx and also the posterior banding which is typically seen in these patients. Pseudo sulcus ocalis is also a feature of these patients and sometimes we may find frank areas of keratosis in the larynx. Pediatric upset sleep apnea syndrome is very easily recognized because the parents often report loud snoring by the child, noisy breathing during sleep and the child often grows with, as a mouth breather with repetitive upper airway infections, nocturnal aneurysis may be associated and the child has temper tantrums and behavioral problems. Attention deficit disorder may also be a feature of pediatric obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. One of the useful self-assessment scales which a patient can do is the Epworth sleepiness scale. This questionnaire provides a measurement of daytime sleepiness and is closely related to the apnea index. Normal score is anything from 2 to 10. In obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, the score may be well over 16. And this is the Epworth sleepiness scale and it's graded from 0 to 3 on a lot of situations, common everyday life situations like reading, watching TV, sitting in a public place and so on and the chances of dosing, the patient does a self-assessment. Now when we see a patient with obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, we have to take a very careful history. The general appearance of the patient has to be noted, height, weight, blood pressure, history of alcohol or drug intake, especially sedatives, because some of them are on sedatives, the mistaken notion that they have a sleep problem. Thyroid evaluation is very essential and a careful ENT and head and neck examination, particularly noting the nasal airway, the tongue, the tongue base, soft palate, uvula, tonsils, nasopharynx, hypopharynx and larynx, as well as the general craniofacial morphology are all very important. It's important to get a detailed history about the snoring and its associated events from the spouse. The site of obstruction can often be picked up by the clinician when he does a preliminary examination of the patient. The size of the neck, what we call the collar size, is also very important. More than truncal obesity, which of course is very important, neck obesity plays a very important role. And a collar size of more than 17 and a half usually spells trouble. An enlarged floppy uvula, an elongated soft palate, tonsillar hypertrophy, hypertrophy of the lateral pharyngeal bands, an enlarged tongue base, micrognathia, retrognathia, all have to be noted by the clinician. Now, what are the investigations that we need to evaluate this condition? Of course, a general and complete blood evaluation, including a chest X-ray and lung function tests are very important. But the gold standard investigation is polysomnography, which was described by Holland, Demont and Reynal in 1974. Now, basically, this is an investigation where there is an overnight monitoring of the patient. And monitoring should include pulse oximetry and tidal carbon dioxide, ECG, EEG, electromyography, and electrooculography, as well as nasal and oral airflow, chest and abdominal movements, and sleeping position. This is a very useful investigation. It helps to differentiate the different types of sleep apnea as well as to evaluate the severity of the problem and to quantify it. Fiber optic endoscopy, particularly when the patient is sleeping, helps to assess the site of obstruction. Dynamic or sleep MRI is now a very useful investigation which is available to the clinician, which very clearly will tell us in a very convincing fashion the level of obstruction, is it retropalatal, retrolingual or is it indeed combined? Typically a polysomnographic finding in obstructive sleep apnea syndrome will show 
cessation of air flow with normal chest mo movements and abdominal movements and we will be showing an expired carbon dioxide building up after the apneic episode. The SpO2 tends to fall during the apneic episodes and when it reaches a very low level the patient usually has an arousal and wakes up. This is a, a typical polysomnography being done in a sleep laboratory in the hospital. It can also be done at home on an ambulant basis. Several equipments are available today from very many manufacturers and it is available at reasonable cost so that many institutions can have access to polysomnography. We are trying to get a matrix, profile matrix of the patient including the respiratory events, desaturations, number of snores and so on. And oximetry is also monitored and the results are very helpful to confirm the sleep apnea and the respiratory evaluation is also very important. All of this is brought together in a graphic summary for the clinician to diagnose and quantify the type of sleep apnea. The diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome is however often made much earlier from a careful history very often from the spouse and the assessment has to be holistic not just doing investigations but looking at the functional and anatomical aspects to quantify the type of sleep apnea to see the number of events which are happening and the extent of the problem but also look at the level of obstruction and polysomnography with dynamic MR in my opinion gives a very good information overall information which are complementary to each other. How do we manage obstructive sleep apnea syndrome? First and foremost is a non-surgical treatment wherein lifestyle modifications will have to be done. Patient will have to be emphasized to be told about the importance of stopping alcohol intake smoking and so on, weight reduction, treatment of systemic disorders like hypothyroidism for example and have a careful review of the drugs that the patient is on. Several medical and intraoral appliances have been suggested and many have been used often with very limited benefit for the patient. If anatomic obstruction is present, corrective surgery may be required. Amongst the non-surgical treatments, certain drugs have been tried, particularly protriptyline, theophylline, progesterone and more recently modafinil. Modafinil seems to be a promising drug, first in a class of the uh, drugs which decrease GABA mediated transmission, but we have to still wait for more reports before we pass judgment on the drug. Amongst the non-surgical treatment, we can also talk about mandibular positioning devices in non-obese patients with micrognathia. These are helpful in some studies, but can often be very cumbersome for the patient. Tongue retaining devices, positional devices, nasal splints have all been tried. But the most important device is the nasal CPAP and we will come to that. These are some of the mandibular positioning devices and the tongue retaining devices which are available commercially. The nasal CPAP is the gold standard in the management of obstructive sleep apnea. Described by Colin Sullivan in 1981, it's a non-invasive and highly effective primary treatment modality for obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. It delivers a continuous flow of air and provides a pneumatic splint to the upper airway during inspiration, preventing collapse during sleep by increasing airway volume, cross-sectional area and lateral dimension in the retropalatal as well as the retroglossal spaces. There are some minor problems which I encountered during nasal CPAP including dermal irritation, dryness, rhinorrhea, some patients have claustrophobia and panic attacks.
which may lead to even the non-compliance. But in general, patients who use nasal CPAP are quite happy using it. Now here is a patient who is using a, a CPAP. Note the tracheostomy. The tracheostomy, of course, is a gold standard in the management, surgical management of obstructive sleep apnea. But in this particular patient, a tracheostomy was performed for an airway obstruction, which was thought to be due to laryngeal edema. Laryngeal edema was a consequence of laryngopharyngeal reflux in this patient who had a gross obstructive sleep apnea. The moment nasal CPAP was instituted in the patient, he could be decandidated comfortably and the patient went home without a tracheostomy. A nasal CPAP apparatus consists of a flow generator, a flow sensor, an analog to digital converter, microprocessor, pressure controller, a patient supply hose, nasal fitting and pressure transducers. Modifications like auto CPAP are now available and it's characterized by its ability to modify the positive pressure level applied to the patient, sensing the patient's requirements. What does a nasal CPAP do? It restores normal respiration during sleep, normalizes the sleep organization, improves daytime alertness, neuropsychiatric function, right heart function and systemic blood pressure. Patients have a success rate well over 70 to 80 percent, although a, a very conservative figure of 50 percent is quoted in long-term studies. The compliance, however, can be an issue and in countries like India, compliance rate may drop to as low as or be even below 50 percent over a course of time. So these are some of the available CPAP machines which are available for the patient. What about surgery? What's the role of surgery in obstructive sleep apnea? In pediatric obstructive sleep apnea, surgery is definitely the first line of management. Removal of obstructive adenoids and tonsils will often cure the problem in patients who have very obstructive, huge tonsils and adenoids causing obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. In general, surgery is contemplated when patients have failed conservative treatment or non-compliant with CPAP. They have to have an AHI or RDI of over 15, oxygen desaturation falling usually below 90 percent and excessive daytime sleepiness which is eroding the normal quality of life. Poor surgical cases are often the patients who have extreme obesity, lack of physical activity, lack of motivation, alcoholism from which they are not willing to come out and type 2 collapse which is a mixed collapse at the palatal as well as the tongue level. What are the surgeries which are thought of? Of course in children, adenotonsectomy is the most commonly performed surgery for pediatric obstructive sleep apnea. U triple P or uvulo palato pharyngoplasty is a very commonly performed procedure for a type 1 collapse. Modifications with the laser, which is called the laser assisted uvulo palatoplasty or LAUP, radio frequency, coablation, and so on have all been used. The principle is the same. Surgical management of tongue base collapse is more complex and may involve hyoid advancement, midline laser glossectomy, mandibular or maxillary osteotomy and advancement, but of course tracheostomy is a gold standard in patients with very severe obstructive sleep apnea. What are the techniques available for enlargement of the retropalatal airway where there is a type 1 collapse mainly at the level of the soft palate? Ulo palatopharyngoplasty, laser assisted uvulopalatoplasty, radio frequency assisted uvulopalatoplasty and coablation assisted uvulopalatoplasty are some of the procedures which are available today. Dr. Ikimatsu and Dr. Fujita described the uvulopalatopharyngoplasty operation where there is removal of excessive redundant tissue in the oropharynx increasing the cross-sectional area at the level of the oropharynx. Success rate in curing snoring can be very high, well over 80 to 85 percent, but 
in reducing the apnea or hypopnea index. In other words, in managing obstructive sleep apnea is varies anything from 20 to 70 percent. And this is thought to be due to poor case selection, particularly in the poor results where management of a palatal issue in a patient with a complex type 2 collapse obviously would not yield results. Complications of the surgery are usually infrequent fortunately, but may include bleeding or a wheel of pharyngeal insufficiency see if excessive tissue is reduced, removed, dryness of the throat, nasopharyngeal stenosis, airway compress, compromise, hypernasality of the speech and so on. But fortunately, these are very uncommon. This is a classical operation where the uvula with a portion of the palate, soft palate, as well as the fossil pillars and tonsils are removed. And this is a, a video which shows the operation being performed, the classical uvulo palato pharyngoplasty. This is done with cold instruments. Obviously, the bleeding is more and the surgeon has to take every effort to minimize blood loss. This is the appearance of the oropharynx in a patient who has undergone uvulopalatopharyngoplasty. What are there any contraindications for uvulopalatopharyngoplasty? Of course, there are. A patient who has got a, an already existing uvulopharyngeal inception, so obviously would be a very poor candidate. In fact, there is an absolute contraindication. Submucosal cleft palate is again something which has to be looked for carefully in the patient. And patients with special voice or swallowing considerations have also got to be treated very carefully before we think about this procedure. Laser assisted uvula palato pharyngoplasty has the advantage of having a clean bloodless field during surgery and the success rate may range in the short term from our, for about 80 to 85 percent to about 70 to 60 percent in the long term and snoring is quite effectively managed by this procedure. The carbon dioxide laser or the KTP 532 laser which is a Mercedes Benz amongst lasers are all very useful. A diode laser can also be used. Here a laser assisted uvulopalatopharyngoplasty is being performed with a KTP 532 laser. A neo uvula is often created and this gives a feeling to the patient that his normal anatomy is being maintained. Larger bleeders are coagulated with a bipolar diathermy and a few stitches are placed at the end to close off the raw wound. Post laser uvulopalatoplasty, you can see the neo uvula, the midline and you can see the nasopharyngeal isthmus and the sphincteric function very well maintained. Complications of uvulopalatopharyngoplasty or UPPP operation include as I said transient uvulopharyngeal incompetence, hemorrhage, wound infections and airway compromise in the early postoperative period. In the late postoperative period, pharyngeal discomfort, prolonged sore throat, dryness and nasopharyngeal stenosis are important complications to mention. This is a patient who had a UPPP operation for the wrong indication. He had a type 2 collapse with palatal and tongue based collapse. And here he's undergone a U triple P. You can see that the palate is soft, but the tongue collapse still continues. And obviously, his sleep apnea problem is not relieved. So this is why the importance of preoperative assessment of the level of collapse prior to embarking on surgery of the palate and the fossil pillars or the U triple P operation. One word of caution when we are embarking on a patient for surgery on a patient with obstructive sleep apnea, particularly the UPPP operation, is the anesthetic component. The anesthetist has to be very well informed about the patient. He should have done a clear assessment. He should have access 
to all the investigations including the polysomnography and he would particularly avoid sedatives and narcotics in this patient. Intubation may be very difficult and may need a fiber optic guided intubation and after extubation a nasopharyngeal airway with proper monitoring of the patient it was a long way in averting trouble. And this is a nasopharyngeal airway which is an extremely useful piece of equipment to use in a patient after extubation. Radio frequency is again a quick and painless procedure and is associated with very minimal edema and this shows the equipment being used and coablation is again a very useful uh, equipment to use for this procedure where the tissue is not heat exploded but is molecularly broken down into smaller base elements such as hydrocarbons and oxides and this leads to very minimal inflammation and pain. And this is a, a video showing a coablator being used in a patient who is undergoing a uvulopalatoplasty. Now coming to surgical procedures for enlargement of the retrolingual space, the whole lot of procedures are now available. Tracheostomy may be required in some of these patients, particularly with very gross mandibular uh, and maxillary deformities. A midline laser glossectomy is a simple procedure but may not be very effective in some of these patients. Lingual plasty and radiofrequency tissue ablation of the tongue base have also been used by some authors with good effect. Mandibular osteotomy with genioglossal advancement is a very effective procedure in my opinion in our experience for widening the retroglossal space. A repose tongue suspension, the intraoral approach has also been done in some centers with uh, titanium screw based at the uh, placed at the lingual cortex of the genial tubercle of the mandible. And this is a, a pictorial representation of the tongue suspension procedure. The genial glossus advancement procedure is a very simple procedure where a midline block of mandible with the genial tubercles is pulled forwards and rotated by 90 degrees and fixed by a special screw and this gets an additional 1 to 1.5 centimeter advancement of the tongue base. Hyoid myotomy and suspension is again a very simple procedure where the hyoid bone is advanced anteriorly and is either fixed to the uh, mandible or to the thyroid ala. Uh, this is a, a pictorial representation of this procedure. Genioglossus advancement and hyoid suspension may sometimes be combined together and this gives a very good successive rate, a success rate of well over 70 percent in patients with a tongue base collapse. These are pictures of genioglossal advancement in a patient in which a block of the uh, mandible in the midline with the uh, genial tubercle has been advanced forwards and fixed with screws. Hyoid distraction procedures have been described by Tucker Woodson where the hyoid bone is split and two separate loops of switches are used to pull the bone not only anteriorly and superiorly but also laterally. Maxillofacial techniques are used in patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea where there is primarily a type 3 collapse or a tongue base collapse. And the principle of maxillomandibular surgery is to advance the skeletal support of soft tissues, namely the tongue and the pharynx that collapse during sleep. The maxillomandibular osteotomy and advancement, which is described by Riley and Powell, is a phase 2 surgery, which is done when phase 1 surgery is ineffective. It improves retropalatal and retrolingual spaces and increases airway caliber in an anteroposterior direction. The success rate is well over 95 percent in carefully chosen patients. Complications like malocclusion, inferior alveolar, lingual or infraorbital paresthesia, non-union, malunion, mal relapse of advancement and TM joint complications as well as need for future restorative dental work have all been described. And this is a, a, a cross-sectional picture 
of the maxillomandibular advancement procedure. So basically, when you are evaluating a patient for surgery, initially we consider a phase 1 surgery after determining the site of obstruction by a sleep MR. A U triple P operation is preferred for a type 1 oropharynx. A U triple P operation with a mandibular osteotomy and hyoid myotomy may be combined for a type 2 procedure, a collapse and a mandibular osteotomy with a hyoid myotomy alone preferred for an exclusive retrolingual collapse or a type 3 collapse. Post-op polysomnography is performed 6 months after the procedure. If there is failure and this is associated with gross facial maxillary abnormalities, then a phase 2 procedure, the maxillary mandibular osteotomy and advancement is performed. This is the Riley Powell Stanford surgical protocol. Tracheostomy is of course the gold standard. It bypasses the area of obstruction altogether. It's indicated in patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea syndrome with a respiratory distress index well over 50 and oxygen saturation falling to below 60 percent or sometimes associated with cardiac arrhythmias. What does the future hold? Neuromuscular stimulation of the genioglossus muscle and as well as direct stimulation of the hypoglossal nerve are all been tried and are in an experimental stage. They have a lot of promise. This is an important condition. To conclude, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome is a very common problem. It's a disease of not only adults but also children and may present with a myriad of symptoms. The, often the patient himself is unaware of the condition. There have been instances where the spouse has had to have a video recording of the husband during sleep and show the video to the husband in the daytime to convince him to seek medical attention. A detailed history, clinical examination and simple overnight observation will often clinch the diagnosis in the vast majority of the patients. A dynamic MR or a sleep MR with fiber optic nasal endoscopy has obviated the need today for cumbersome cephalometric measures which we used to do in the past. This will help us to establish the site of obstruction. Continuous nasal positive airway pressure and tracheostomy are the gold standard in the management of the patient. In properly selected patients, UPPP operation, laser assisted uvula palatoplasty, radio frequency or coablation may all be used as well as tongue and mandibular advancement procedures can all be performed with good results. Thank you very much.